My name is Mazen with the support of the team. I will be the moderator for the fourth panel under the Lebanon Looking Forward Forum. First, I would, welcome, I would like to welcome uh, our chairman for this fourth panel, Mr. Ghassan Diba. Mr. Diba is a professor of economics and the chairman of economics at the Lebanese American University. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Texas at Austin. His research and teaching, teaching interests include political economy, artificial intelligence, and capitalism. Mr. Diba will be the chairman of the Enhancing Societal Welfare panel in our Lebanon Looking Forward Forum. The floor is yours, Mr. Diba. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the Lebanese Citizen Foundation and the Norwegian Embassy for this, and uh, Mr. Bifani for this interesting, uh, for these two interesting days, although I did not attend yesterday. Talking about uh, societal welfare, uh, I think uh, where the panelists, we have of course a distinguished set of panelists and discussants, uh, which uh, the moderator will then introduce, uh, discussing various things, inequality, culture, and migration, and labor. And I think there is a certain thread that connects uh, these three elements. Now, as we know, inequality ebbs and flows. Uh, the history of the 20th century in terms of what happened to inequality in advanced capitalist countries in the post-World War II period, after the neoliberal capital counter-revolution, if you want, in the 1980s, uh, the history of that inequality and reasons and general theory, if you want, uh, has been ex uh, expanded upon by Thomas Piketty, as we all know, in the book Capital in the 21st Century. Now in Lebanon, inequalities, uh, I think, were shaped, we're lucky or unlucky, shaped by two financial crises, the one that started in the 1980s till the early 1990s, and the current financial and economic crisis that started in 2019. Now these two crises had tremendous impact on inequality, on hollowing the middle class, taking out the uh, incomes and wealth of the many, as also including, as I think uh, uh, Mohammed said, uh, destruction of wealth and maybe destruction of the rentier, and also shaped by the post-war reconstruction episode. So since the 1980s, we have been living in a period with different manifestations that affected inequality in Lebanon. Now the reconstruction period, as also was mentioned, was uh, skewed the Lebanese economy to the interests of the rentier. The relationship between public debt, and unfortunately, uh, Dr. Lydia Asquad will not be with us, but the relationship between public debt and the building of the Ta'if confessional state was the cornerstone of the political economic regime that we have experienced since 1992 and which led the economic crisis of 2019, but also embedded within it, before the crisis, the rise of inequality as a result of these, of the structural, these structural changes and economic, fiscal, and monetary policies that were implemented since 1992. And with it, of course, the rise of the financial aristocracy, or as uh, my friend Hamad Zbib would call the oligarchy, right? Very similar to what Marx analyzed of the French society in the class struggles of France and the 18th of Brumaire. We had almost a similar rise of the financial aristocracy, the banking system, the lumpen proletariat, and so on. And by the way, right, the rentier actually died or committed suicide in the crisis, right? That's something that some people may gloss over, that the crisis not only 
destroyed the middle class and the working class, but also destroyed the rentier and the financial aristocracy. And that's why we see that they are battling hard right, in order to maintain their position in the economy and, of course, in politics. So we see inequalities, whether in Lebanon or in, around the world, are complex and, and nonlinear and in different periods manifest themselves differently. So we have the hollowing right, of the middle strata in Lebanon of society, of the middle class and the working class. And here just a footnote maybe, in relation to what was uh, spoken earlier regarding the financial losses and so on. Now we see that uh, there is a concentration Right, on the financial losses of the dollar depositors. But we should be talking about what happened to the Lebanese pound depositors and the workers and the pensioners and the would-be pensioners. There was a huge redistribution of wealth and income in, as a result of the crisis and limiting the discussion, the political economic discussion to the losses in the financial sector right, is totally wrong at this time in history. How does that relate also to culture? Right? We know inequality increases the element, populist elements in society the rise of right-wing populism, racism, xenophobia, ethnic strife is a result of inequality. And I think we as a cosmopolitan, as many people maybe alluded to but did not mention it, right, as a cosmopolitan culture that we have in Lebanon will suffer as a result of the rise of inequality with the rise of ethnic and confessional politics again. So that's also how we should view inequality. It's not only an economic issue. It's not only about wealth or inequality of income, but also how it affects politics. And we see that in Europe, and we saw it tremendously in a stark fashion in the United States with the rise of the right and the Trump administration. Finally, on migration and labor, I think migration in Lebanon has always worked as a safety valve for the economic system. And that's not also, that's not peculiar to Lebanon. Some people think that this is peculiar to Lebanon. I mean, Europe, in the 19th century, the migration to the United States was also a safety valve for some of the European economies after the 1848 springtime of the peoples, as mentioned by the renowned Marxist historian Eric Hofsbaum. So Lebanon, yes, we've seen this migration, and we've seen it. Somebody mentioned that. I think Dr. Haraki from the World Bank, when he was discussing the paper by the excellent presentation by Dr. Diwan, that we have a migration of the skilled labor and any future economic model will have to deal with that. Finally, something also that we think the migration of skilled labor, right, whether you think it's positive or negative, I think it is created, has created a dual economy in Lebanon and is very much related to uh, the question of inequality. Skilled labor getting higher income in GCC countries or in Europe, while unskilled labor or less skilled labor remaining in Lebanon, the income widens between the two parts of the labor force. Essentially, since around one third of the labor force, we're not talking about the migration, let's say, of, or, or uh, the few 
Americans or British who are living in the GCC relative to the economy of the UK or the US. But around one third of the Lebanese labor force gets their, its income from foreign, in foreign economies, which causes this dual economy and it has a lot of ramification, including macroeconomic ramifications, but that's not our discussion here. It has a lot of ramification on inequality of income and wealth in the country, and that's something also that we should be looking at. So without further ado, we uh, start the, uh, the session, and hopefully it will be a fruitful session on the different aspects probably of the same problem that Lebanon is facing as a result of this catastrophic crisis, financial and economic crisis that we are passing through. And thank you very much. Thank you for our chairman for this panel, Mr. Diba. If you can have a seat on the stage, that would be great. Uh, we will proceed now introducing the first uh, sessionist, the author of the paper called Culture, Arts and Heritage, Mrs. Anne-Marie Maila Afesh. Mrs. Afesh is the CEO and General Director of the General Council of Museums in Lebanon, MA holder in History Archaeology from the University of Aix Provence and diploma, uh, diploma from Ecole de Louvre. She is supervising the National Museum of Beirut since 2009, Director of the Museography Display between 2014 and 2016, Contributor in the restitution of stolen artifacts to Lebanon in 2017. Mrs. Afesh is previous editor-in-chief of the Bulletin d'Archéologie et d'Architecture Libanaise, the annual scientific journal of the Ministry of Culture. She is prolific publisher of which the most recent, the National Museum Guidebook. Mrs. Anne-Marie Afesh is an award holder of the Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres and the distinction of the Officiale dell'Ordine della Stella d'Italia. Welcome, Mrs. Afesh. I would like to remind you that the sessions will be streamed over Zoom and our social media platform, and the author papers are published on the Citizen Foundation website. The discussant of Mrs. Afesh will be Mr. Nadim Shammas, executive, consultant, and coach in fashion, beauty, and other creative industries. Nadim Shammas is involved in the fashion and creative scene in Lebanon since 2005, former general manager of Eli Saab and head of operations at Fasonable. He is the founder and GM of Fashion Next Door and executive coach in the creative industry and a mentor at End of World Lebanon. Nadim is also active in the film and theater scenes as a screenwriter and an actor. He is a board member of Metropolis, manager of Metropolis Cinema and co-founder of Creal. Nadine owns a degree in economics from Louvain University, an MBA from HEC Paris, a master in fashion management from EFM Paris, and certificate in professional and executive coaching from University of Texas in Dallas. I would like to welcome both of you and uh, remind our attendees of the ground rules of our session. Our session will, uh, will be for 40 minutes, so we'll give uh, the author a 15 minutes to tell us more about the paper and then six to seven minutes for our discussant, and then uh, we'll take questions from the chairman, the public, and uh, the online attendees. The floor is yours, Mr. Havesh. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the Lebanese Citizen Foundation, the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Beirut, and the Institute of Political Science at St. Joseph University, for inviting me to participate in this distinguished forum. The paper I'm presenting today is entitled Culture, Arts, and Heritage. It is based on my personal experience in the specific cultural fields uh, where I have been working for more than 20 years. And thus, it reflects only a modest part of the overall cultural scene in Lebanon. In the early 1990s, as a young archaeologist, I took part in the rehabilitation process of the National Museum of Beirut, which was severely damaged during the Civil War. That early experience, followed by two decades of ascertaining and understanding our cultural roots, 
in building our identity as a unique and distinct people. And now, as a front row witness of several, uh, of the degradation, I would say, of some archeological artifacts and to the neglect of several valuable national monuments, I note painfully the serious threats of losing the legacy of our distant and rich past if we fail to rise to this challenge and if no corrective action is taken soon. Thankf thankfully, however, years dedicated to a variety of reconstruction, rehabilitation, and restoration projects also taught me that awareness of and education about our cultural heritage are key success factors in safeguarding it. So I remain hopeful that the threats can be com com countered and permanent losses prevented or minimized, let's say, if we can rebuild broad-based support for our heritage in both the public sector and society at large. In the past few years, the National Museum was presented as an example or a case study of safeguarding a unique legacy in time of crisis while addressing the key issues involved in protecting it in conflict areas and during challenging times. How do archeologists and museum curators actually safeguard their collections? How do they engage in the process of reviving them after the crisis? Learning from these difficult episodes, what are the best ways to preserve these collections for future generation? The experience with our National Museum over the past decades highlights not only the importance of emergency preparedness, but also points at strategy, funding, commitment, ethics, and leadership as essential ingredients. Today, in the midst of the terrible collapse Lebanon has been experiencing since 2019, what is the place given to culture? The crisis has underlined the fragility of the sector at a time when economic, financial, and social issues are the obvious priorities. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic and the devastating double explosion in the port of Beirut on August 4, 2020, have delivered serious blows to the capital, to the country, and to its culture. In this context of widespread failure, the Lebanese people are fighting for survival, struggling every day to find a way to earn a living for their family, and somehow trying to adapt to the worst crisis Lebanon has faced in a century. At such difficult time, how can we at least counter and hopefully reverse uh, the severe decline in the priority accorded to the cultural sector in the country. My paper addresses three groups of questions. First, what is cultural heritage? And what specifically are we talking about here? Second, who is in charge of Lebanon's cultural heritage? And what are the main laws and regulations relevant to this field? Three, what are the key financial and non-financial issues facing the sector? What about the roles of the private funding and of international support? A brief reminder first, in its broadest definition, cultural heritage refers to sites, monuments, historic buildings, artistic representation, and artifacts often preserved in museum and exhibited in museums and galleries and in private collections. It encompasses also artistic creations and industries, music, cinema, visual and performing arts and literature. And accordingly, cultural heritage connotes our way of life as well as our common system of knowledge, beliefs, values, and behaviors. My focus in the paper, especially on our tangible heritage, and more particularly on the way it is perceived by Lebanese society and managed by the public sector at this time. 
On that basis, some lines of inquiry emerge for our discussion. Is our heritage insufficiently known, or is it perhaps misunderstood within the country? Could these be the reasons for the lack of priority and respect it receives at home? How severe are the threats to Lebanon's heritage today, and what can be done to counter and reverse these threats? As the title of this forum is Lebanon Looking Forward, so I would offer the following forward-looking comments to get our discussion going. Four points. First, encouraging people to frequent the art sector is not enough. What is needed is far greater to support, is a far greater support from national and local authorities within the framework of a coherent, coherent long-term cultural strategy for the country. Two, despite the recent laws regulating the Minister of Culture and its affiliated institutions, there is no comprehensive plan for the management of our national heritage, on which takes, um, one which takes into consideration Lebanon's cultural diversity, nor is there adequate enforcement of existing laws and regulation applicable to all players operating in the sector. Three, while there have been recent efforts at decentralization as well as several private initiatives that started many years ago to promote festivals in the regions, the government has failed to establish cultural centers, cinema performance theaters, galleries, arts and crafts hubs, and active libraries, especially in the regions and in rural areas. Four, sound governance is sorely lacking at several levels, as are appropriate incentives and facilities for artists, practitioners, and students engaged in cultural and creative activities. Greater and more widespread respect for culture as a priority is a prerequisite for the significant enhancement needed in the governance practices of several organizations. May I conclude this introduction by quoting the Reverend Selim Dakash. In a recent speech on the occasion of the construction of the BIMA, the Beirut Modern Art Museum, Rector Dakash said, and I quote the words he expressed in French, Quelqu'un dirait, est-ce un moment propice au cœur de cette crise multiforme pour que la première pierre du musée d'art contemporain de Beyrouth soit posée N'est-il pas préférable de dépenser de l'argent pour l'enseignement, l'éducation, la santé et l'hospitalisation Comme ces questions ont une résonance, une sincérité et une franchise dans les arts en général et dans l'art de la peinture et du dessin, il y a une créativité et une création, un dépassement vers le sublime, et une sortie de la crise, même si ça exige la prise en considération des besoins fondamentaux. Le travail acharné de la raison politique et sociale requiert également et surtout la créativité artistique, car cette créativité ne fait que peindre la réalité telle qu'elle est et oriente le regard de la personne vers la vision de construire l'avenir. Elle était et sera toujours la composante essentielle de l'entité libanaise. End of quote. So on that inspiring note, I look forward to your comments and our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Afesh. Mr. Shamas, the floor is yours. Hello. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Afesh, for this Nice paper. Thank you first for the, <coughs> to the Lebanese Citizen Foundation, to the Norwegian Embassy and University Saint Joseph uh, for giving me the pleasure to attend. Hello. Um, 
The first happy birthday for the National Museum. I think we celebrated three days ago the 85th anniversary. So that's good news. Uh, inshallah. So uh, I recommend to all the participants who, to the attendants who didn't check, uh, who didn't have the time to read the paper of uh, Madame Hafez to do so. It's uh, available, I think, on the website of the Lib Lebanese Citizen Foundation. It's a great paper, and I think you've shown, you've expressed, you've explained uh, to us. Um, the achievement that you have been able to, to accomplish uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this position uh, despite the very low funding available. I think you mentioned in this paper that the funding uh, of the ministry, that the budget of the ministry is 0.24% of the total national budget, which is a fourth of the minimum uh, uh, recommended by UNESCO, which is 1%. So uh, congratulations for this ach achievement. So I would like to, to continue a little bit and share from my perspective and my modest experience on the side of the creative industries what, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, could or should be done in order to move forward and to look forward, as you have mentioned. So looking forward, I think that we need two things. We need uh, less government interference from one side and more state on the other side, and I will explain why. So first is obviously, in my opinion, less government interference. Uh, on one side, which is on the soft part of the heritage, okay, so on all the artistic creation and these industries. I'm talking about not only fashion, design, craftsmanship, but also uh, performing uh, acts, film, theater, gaming, food, etc. As a practitioner in this sector, we always see the same pattern from our government. So it's either the rules that are applicable are uh, ancestral, to say the least. Either we have some good, good, good rules that are, that are applied but are a, an issue and doesn't allow the development of our activity. Or we have sim simply a random application of some rules. Just to give some examples, in the fashion industry, uh, when we import goods, do you know that if you want to import goods legally, not, I say legally, and I insist on that point, your invoice has to be signed in blue ink. Okay, so we spend our time in our company in fashion sending to our suppliers, your invoice has to be signed by blue ink because the government doesn't recognize the black ink. And if you have an invoice without a stamp, you know a stamp, it is rejected by the customs. So just to give an example, and this applies to fashion, craftsmanship, and again, uh, this can look as minor, but it is a serious, uh, a serious obstacle for the de development of our industries. We need to know on which basis our industry can work. We need to have a normal cost in importing goods, if ever we are allowed to import goods in, in the future. Um, a small parenthesis compared to the economic presentation that has been done before. Uh, it is impossible for any, almost impossible for any of the creative industry in the future to perform if we don't have a minimum of imported raw material or semi-finished finished products to our country. So I close the parenthesis. So when it comes to fashion design and beauty, we've experienced uh, uh, many obstacles in, 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 uh, in performing our, uh, our business. Now on the art side, uh, the biggest issue is of course censorship. As you all know, uh, you have to go and have, uh, okay, so if you write a play, uh, so you invent a character, you write his line, and then you have to go to an office where someone decides if the line that you've just wrote is acceptable or not. So obviously censorship in this way or control of the speech is impossible when you want to have efficient performing arts. Movies have to be approved. I can share with you many stories where if you have a sheikh passes, passing on or a priest with a half-naked woman, this would not, wouldn't be allowed and the director has to reshoot the scene just because it is not good. So the way this censorship law is applied is uh, of course, a, an obstacle also for the development of the performing the arts. And I don't mention, of course, the indirect censorship that you can live with uh, pressure groups such as religious pressure groups. I think we all remember the Mashru Alayla uh, story that has nothing to do with law, but only, only pressure. So from one side, we think that I think that we need uh, to, to have less government 
and less interference from our government when it comes to art and culture. On the other hand, I mean, uh, why do we recommend that? We recommend that not only for the beauty and not for protecting our business. First, because the creative industries uh, create value to the economy, one. Uh, secondly, they have a high added value, so they need a minimum import of raw material, but you have a high added value which gives value to the economy. Uh, our industry, I mean, these industries employ a lot of people, so today it was estimated to around 6%, but according to the study of the Institut de Finance, the actual direct and indirect people living from the creative industry is around 20%, which is huge. Of course, all the creative industry uh, participate to the development of the brand name Lebanon abroad. I'm sure that uh, Jubran Khalil Jubran or Nadine Labaki has done much better to our uh, brand name Lebanon than other Jubran or other people, uh, our other politicians. And finally, uh, on a pure economic point of view, uh, uh, I mean, this could be a huge, uh, a huge flow of effects to our country. Tourism, not only creative industry, but tourism, just to give an example, tourism in Jordan uh, brought to, in 2019 $6 billion. Okay. So it's not only creative industry, but you can imagine what is the potential if you are able to unleash not only the creative part of that, but also the, the second part, which is the, the, the um, uh, as you said, uh, Madame Fish, the tangible part of the uh, tangible part. Now I go to the second part, so from one side, less government interference, in my opinion, and then from the second si side, more state involvement in the, in the tangible part of the heritage, as you, as you just mentioned. Uh, so in your paper, you have a description of the heritage, and I, I picked up another one, which is from uh, Francoise Choet, which mentions, and it's a free translation, that heritage is the assets a group of assets meant for the fulfillment of a community, extended to planetary dimension. So when I just start with these few words, meant for the fulfillment of a community, I mean, that struck me. It means that we need to have a public se sector and we need to have a state. One, to organize these assets, and second, to make them available to the public. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, if you have a heritage, we need to have a public sector, again, I'm repeating myself, to organize these assets and then to make them available to the, to the audience or to the community. And, and then, I mean, when we, look at, when we look at the last 20 years, in my opinion, or 30 years, in my opinion, the only movement that is very clear in many sectors is the opposite of that, is the privatization of our country. Okay. And I noticed that it was a subject that was raised yesterday. Dr. Ibrahim Werde mentioned to us how since the beginning and uh, when the former uh, uh, President Hariri came, uh, came in power and with the Solidair project, the whole idea was to have no money from the public sector and everything privatized, no debt for Lebanon. This is what Dr. Uh, Werde mentioned to us. Uh, and uh, Madame uh, Mona Fawaz mentioned also how the real estate and the land has been financed, financized, I don't know, I mean, taken into the financial sphere and taken out from the, from the, from the public sector. So this trend of privatization seems to me an issue because it's impossible to have a heritage, uh, to, it's impossible in my opinion to, uh, to uh, uh, protect, nurture, and develop our heritage without a strong public sectors. And if we look back at the last years, public space is shrinking, uh, seaside is occupied, historic build buildings taken away, very few public initiatives in museum, except uh, the modern art uh, museum and the renovation, of course. But yeah, 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 you mentioned in your paper, so you have very few one, or at least they have been done with the support of France, Italy, Greece, and Germany, and to some extent to the private sector. But there is no real commitment of the government. We have some sites such as the Grotto Jaita who are literally privatized, who have been literally privatized, so taken away from the public sphere. Uh, and of course, uh, <laughs> on the private sector, we have a large number of masterpieces who are owned today by private, private people, which is also something that we need as, as independent, and as, as, as citizens to question ourselves. Is the place of these pieces uh, in our homes? I mean, this is something that we need to, 
to, uh, to think about. So we cannot, so I repeat, we cannot in a sustainable way protect, nurture, and develop our heritage without an impartial state who could organize this fund and make it available to the public. And uh, finally, I mean, culture, uh, as Dr. Dibar mentioned, is, is, it could be an excellent way to open up to other subjects and, 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 and important ones. I was, I was, uh, um, I open a small parenthesis here uh, about the monuments. I was, qu I was questioning myself and I was trying to remember how many monuments our governments during the last 30 years have established in the country. And I know, uh, just a monument. I, I don't think I remember any, any, anything that have been done. So I made a small research and I'm no wonder why. So monuments come from monere, which means from the Latin, which means warns and reminds. So monuments challenges our memory or our remembrance. And Francoise Chouet give this, it's a small moment of poetry, allow me, <laughs> give this very nice words about monuments. She says, uh, it's a free translation, that the monument is a protection against the trauma of existence. A monument is a safety device. The monument assures, reassures, calms down by averting humans from time. The monument is the guardian of our pasts, and it calms the anxiety generated by the uncertainty of new beginnings. The monument recalls the past by making it vibrate like the present. So the monument recalls the past by making it vibrate like the present. So no wonder that uh, some of our rulers were not interested at all by establishing new monuments in, in our country. So, in a conclusion, let's state our, our, our view, our take on that point. Let's take for the cultural and artistic activities a solid state with a good governance for the heritage and the tangible assets. And finally, culture as a tool, first to create value and employment, to bring effects, and finally, hopefully, to open a discussion at the level of our country about our past and our history. Thank you. Thanks to you, Mr. Shemes. <laughs> Mrs. Asfesh, I, I believe you have a few things to say to reply to. It's fine. You wanted to tell something during. No, uh, when, uh, when you were talking about uh, the museums, and uh, yes, there was, uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, there were a lot of new initiatives to create new museums. So national museum, as I'm talking about, the museum that will be under uh, the governance of the Ministry of Culture. So a part of the National Museum of Beirut, we do have a few museums, national museums, that are within the sites, uh, like Baalbek Museum, which is a site museum, uh, Biblos Museum, Tripoli in the Citadel, and uh, Beit Din. Now, there were many new projects for museums, one uh, in uh, Tyre and uh, one in Beirut. In Beirut, downtown Beirut, just in front of the Nahar building. And uh, this museum was supposed to be the museum of history, of the history of Beirut, that would have included the whole new discoveries that the archaeologists uh, realized uh, the last, um, I mean, between 19, uh, the early 1990s until 1998. Uh, so all these uh, artifacts, objects, but also all the documentation that archaeologists were able to collect during the, these years of uh, excavations, we were supposed to uh, host them in a beautiful uh, museum and the, um, the funding came from the Kuwaiti uh, fund. And uh, uh, we were supposed to start the, uh, the creation of this museum as the architect with, of course, the municipality of Beirut, the CDR, Solidaire, and, uh, um, and of course, the Ministry of Culture. Uh, the, um, the, the, the whole the collection is still here, of course, and uh, the whole uh, idea of creating a museum is still, uh, holding is still here, 
And even the plan were done by the famous architect uh, Renzo Piano. So uh, everything was in place, let's say, to start uh, the creation of, uh, and I'm talking about national museum, these national museums. Next to these uh, national museums, we had, of course, beautiful private museums during the last uh, uh, 10 years and more. Uh, and uh, Okay, I will not uh, uh, count them all, but I talked about the BIMA, which is the uh, future uh, Beirut Modern Art Museum which will be just next to the Mi Museum, both of them being in the uh, University St. Joseph uh, area. I mean, uh, under the, in the same uh, parcel, let's say, in the same lot. Thank you, Mr. Hafez, for clarifying this point. Concerning the, the museum, there is a question. Uh, are you planning on restarting the initiative of the Night of the Museum? If yes, what are the challenges that you might face? Yes, so the Night of the Museum is a, uh, an initiative and a, a beautiful activity that we started uh, seven years ago. And uh, it, it was that uh, we realized that uh, us in the museums, we had to invite the society and the people. And to say the museum is not here just as a monument, uh, uh, cold and uh, empty. It needs people. It needs, uh, this is a place where you can feel the social cohesion, you can feel that this is an inclusive uh, museum, all museums should be inclusive and uh, open to the public. This is in the definition of a museum. The museum is an open space at the service of the society. So uh, this initiative of the uh, musée, Nuit des Musées started and we realized the first year we had about 2,000 people, 3,000 people and the last year which was in 2000. Uh, 18, we had more than 10,000 people between 5 o'clock and 12 o'clock. And then we enlarged, of course, it was not only the National Museum, but all the Museum of Lebanon, uh, which wanted to participate and to take part to this big feast. It was an event, but it was also a way to celebrate culture, to celebrate uh, the, the collections that are uh, within these uh, museums and that usually people do not, uh, do not know, I must say. And so it was a way to invite them to come and discover their own heritage. This belongs to all Lebanese people and to all people. So uh, this was a way to invite them and that's why it has so much, it had so much success. This year, we were thinking of it, of course, but uh, within, I mean, these difficult conditions, as we do not have uh, electricity in the museum, and we have to open only a few hours instead of the nine to five, today we are opening only from 10 to two. So uh, uh, it was very difficult, and especially uh, we thought it was, uh, it was not a nice idea to uh, say to people, come and, uh, uh, enjoy yourself in a museum when people are struggling for, for their living. So we will do it uh, eventually, as soon as we can, as we, soon as we can offer them all this for free. Thank you. I uh, would love to take questions from the public, if anyone has any question. Yes, hello. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. My, my question relates to, in fact, uh, schools. Do you, do you um, go, because culture starts with, uh, with small kids, huh? do you go to schools and do they come send you uh, classes that, uh, that, are, uh, that visit museum, etc.? Yes, yes, we do. We used to. I mean, it's been a few years that it's different, and especially because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, things stopped at its level, but we were not the only one. I mean, 90% of uh, worldwide museum closed their doors uh, between 2019 and uh, 2021. Um, so um, the, uh, the schools, yes, it's a very important. We have uh, like a program. Uh, we used to have a program with schools, and usually on Wednesdays we used to have... Uh, uh, people coming with special guides uh, that are, um, you know, that are here to, uh, 
welcome them and to explain things differently. So uh, these, these, these students and, uh, have a, a different experience in museum. To show them that the museum is not uh, something cold or empty or it is uh, enjoyable. You can learn, but you can play also and uh, you can discover a lot of things. So, yes, we have been working uh, hard on these visits. A lot of uh, um, associations were here to help us in this. I think of Biladi, uh, which is a, uh, an association that uh, has developed very special programs for schools. And Biladi is, uh, was able to get funding, uh, to get uh, funding for these uh, visits. Thank you. Okay, another question from uh, from my side concerning the, the censorship that you've talked about, uh, Mr. Shamas. So, in your opinion, and as well for Mrs. Afesh, in your opinion, what what is the role that the expert and the civil society can play in advocating uh, for a change on this censorship law to ensure that we're having more uh, culture or concert or movies uh, accepted within the society? What role can they play? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the first role is uh, to go and vote and for electing uh, people who can change the laws. And the second is really pressure. Uh, and again, the idea is not as a state, there are no limits. There are, of course, public, uh, public concern. And it is the role of a state to uh, protect the public, uh, uh, the public, uh, enfin, l'ordre public, donc, uh, so the public uh, rules of a country. The, the idea is just to avoid the, the avoid all the uncertainties that goes around it because it really doesn't make sense and it's absurd. It gives a very bad image about our country. Uh, just to talk about, I mean, uh, the, 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 whole, the whole thing about uh, the, when you have uh, Jewish names, authors or movies with Jewish names, Okay, sometimes they're accepted, sometimes they're not. Okay, I'm very happy that no one digged into Sigmund Freud's family or Marcel Proust, because otherwise they would be wiped out. I mean, so it's really, it's really embarrassing at a point. And I think it's very important that the public society voice out and say that no discrimination is allowed. And if the government and the state would like to set up rules, let them be clear rules. And with an independent justice, this can work like any other country. Great, thank you. Mrs. Diba, Mr. Diba. I just have a, uh, I think a general comment. Thank you, thank you very much for the uh, presentations. Uh, I think the, what is discussed or has been presented, whether from the question of cultural heritage uh, in Lebanon and the need for, uh, or for the existence of creative industries, I think links very much with uh, the necessity for a new economic or uh, social model in Lebanon that uh, Dr. Uh, Ishaq Diwan talked about, uh, especially when he mentioned uh, on what basis do we build this new economic model based on digitalization services uh, and so on. I think you mentioned, uh, Mr. Shamas, uh, gaming. Uh, so I think that links very much with uh, what is needed uh, because the post-1992 economic model uh, that was also mentioned uh, was very austere, if you want, uh, uh, with regard uh, to, to culture, uh, creativity, uh, the spread of, let's say, cinemas, theater. Uh, this was not, uh, these issues were not given any if, not, if not, not even the least priority in the post-war reconstruction period. So I think when we think about, after the current crisis, about a new economic model, of course it's also a new social model, and right? we're talking about uh, societal welfare, uh, a new cultural model, uh, a new model in which we really uh, harness the creative uh, potential and capabilities uh, of the Lebanese people. And that's how things, I think, come together. Maybe we need 
really uh, uh, because we don't want the discussion of culture and, and, and creativity to be a fringe element. We need, we need a certain cultural maybe revolution, right, or intifada in the culture, right, in order to uh, have a new uh, economic and political model. And of course, I'd love to hear your opinion on, on that. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, j j just to confirm what you're saying, Dr. Dibao, which is very important. I mean, uh, uh, most of the creative industry have also this uh, specificity that they have many, they, they employ a lot of people in different, in different areas. Just to take fashion. In fashion, you need to have the thread, you need to have the fabric manufacturer, you need to have the retail stores, you need to have people who sew, you produce packaging, you do transportation, but then again, you have people to shoot. So you have photographer, you have editors, you have uh, IT people who work on editing and saving the pictures, and then you have uh, press, journalist. So if you have one successful fashion brand, it's like 12 or 13 sectors that could live around it. On top of that, uh, Lebanon has a fantastic asset, which is it's a small country. So if, if you compare to some other areas, it's extremely convenient to have, except for the cost of transportation, but it's still extremely convenient to have these activities being split if you have the right infrastructure. So we could very well have sewing being done in an area and the packaging being done in a third area and the labeling being done in a third one, photography in, uh, in uh, Tripoli and then editing in Jezin. That's not an issue. So uh, uh, having this network of, of, uh, of, um, of businesses around us is something very easy to be done in Lebanon. And you are right. Uh, this is a typical good industry to, to, to invest on, in, in my opinion. However, and again, I don't know if someone from the world, from the FMI is here, it's impossible to do it if you don't have a minimum of importation. So uh, if you cannot import a minimum of our raw material, it's impossible to do anything, except maybe literature, but that's very, very, very limited. Thank you so much. If we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank our chairman, Mrs. Afesh and Mr. Shamas, and we will move to our next session for this panel.